Whenever evolutionists discuss natural clocks, they tend to avoid the ones that show the bankruptcy of their dogma. There is no greater example of this than the accumulation of dust on the moon. At the rate at which moon dust accumulates, the surface of the moon should be covered by a layer of dust over a mile deep. In the 60s, NASA scientists were seriously concerned that any space vehicle landing on the moon would simply sink into the surface. However, when NASA eventually sent astronauts to the moon, they found a layer of dust only a few inches deep. How could this be if the moon is really billions of years old? I had to investigate. On May 25, 1961, in a congressional address, President John Kennedy committed the United States to the goal of landing human beings on the moon by the end of the decade. In reality, this project had already had its origins a decade earlier under Dwight D. Eisenhower, but Kennedy was the first president to publicly announce this goal. This was a gutsy thing to do, as at the time, only one American had ever even been in space. But it was a necessary gesture to demonstrate military superiority over the Soviet Union after being second place to them in every important milestone up to that point. The project of getting a man on the moon was called the Apollo Program, and it consisted of multiple missions designed to come incrementally closer to an actual moon landing. Over the course of a few years, C.W. McCracken from the Goddard Space Flight Center and M. Dubin from NASA headquarters culled together measurements of cosmic dust obtained by Explorer 1 and Sputnik 3 in 1958, Vanguard 3 in 1959, and Explorer 8 in 1960. They presented their findings to NASA and in December of 1961 published them in the journal Nature. They concluded that the amount of dust on the moon, on average, would be equal to one gram per square centimeter, with certain geographical areas having a dust layer as deep as one full meter. McCracken and Dubin continued making measurements of lunar dust from multiple methods, and in 1965 concluded that, both from the optical properties of the scattering of sunlight observed from the Earth, and from early Ranger photographs, there was no evidence for a deep dust layer. In May of 1966, Surveyor 1 touched down on the surface of the moon and recorded a layer of dust just a few centimeters thick. At no point in the program was NASA ever concerned about an extensive dust layer. They had data as far back as the 1950s showing the accumulation of dust to be very little. So where did this argument come from? It originally appeared in 1971 when Harold Slusher published an article in the June edition of the Creation Research Society Quarterly Journal entitled, Some Astronauts astronomical evidences for a youthful solar system. Among the evidences was a reference to a 1950s measurement of dust in the Earth's atmosphere conducted by Hans Pettersen. Pettersen had gone to the top of two mountains in Hawaii, run air through a smog detector, and then simply measured the dust which had accumulated. He concluded that Earth is bombarded by 5 to 15 million tons of space dust each year and published these findings in the February 1960 issue of Scientific American. From there, Slusher embellished Pettersen's findings by concluding that the moon should have a layer of dust over 1,400 feet deep. In contrast, when McCracken and Dubin published their direct measurements, however, the actual influx was between 18,000 and 25,000 tons per year, nowhere near the millions that Slusher had predicted. Slusher's argument might have gone nowhere, except that Henry Morris included it in his 1974 book, Scientific Creationism. Since then, other creationists have restated the argument with even more creative numbers, including Walt Brown, who developed the hydroplate theory. I will cover that in a future episode. Even Morris reworked the argument to claim the actual influx was 200 million tons per year in the 1985 edition of Scientific Creationism. He also went a step further in citing a 1959 article, the first ever, written by Isaac Asimov, concluding, But what about the moon? It travels through space with us, and although it is smaller and has a weaker gravity, it too should sweep up a respectable quantity of micrometeors. To be sure, the moon has no atmosphere to friction the micrometeors to dust, but the act of striking the moon's surface should develop enough heat to do the job. On the moon, there are no oceans to swallow the dust, no winds to disturb it, or life forms to mess it up generally one way or another. The dust that forms must just lie there, and if the moon gets anything like Earth's supply, it could be dozens of feet thick. In fact, the dust that strikes crater walls quite probably rolls down hills and collects at the bottom, forming drifts that could be 50 feet deep or more. Why not? I get a picture, therefore, of the first spaceship picking out a nice level place for landing purposes, coming slowly downward, tail first, 
and sinking majestically out of sight. On April 1st, 1993, in the Journal of Creation, Andrew A. Snelling and David Rush published an in-depth examination of the many measurements and creationist arguments regarding the amount of dust on the moon and determined that the amount present was consistent with the evolutionist timeline and advised their readers that the argument is one that creationists should not use. So if the creationists themselves don't think this is a good argument, why did I do an episode about it? Because neither Snelling nor Rush speak for the entire creation community. This argument has continued to be resurrected in the decades since by numerous creationists, including Ken Hoven. Even as recently as 2014, the argument was somewhat revived when NASA released the newly discovered measurements of dust damage to solar panels from the moon. It was initially thought that the majority of the damage came from radiation, but upon re-examination, the damage was seen to have come from dust particles. This showed ten times more dust accumulation than was expected. Creationist Larry Dye, who refers to himself as the creationist, creation guy, jumped on this discovery and, in February of 2015, announced that the moon dust argument might just still apply. Just like Henry Morris, though, Dye's presentation of the argument was a little late. What the solar panels actually showed was something that astronauts had already been vocal about. The moon actually appeared to have an atmosphere. Reports of haze in the horizon on the moon had been relegated to being merely unexplained, even after being observed from orbit. Three months before Dye attempted to resurrect the argument, the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, or LADY, detected not only particles, but an atmosphere about one one hundred thousandth as thick as Earth's. This is akin to Earth's atmosphere at altitudes where the International Space Station orbits. In a previous episode, I extolled the values of accurate measurement. Several times over the course of this investigation, I was aware of how important it is to keep the data acquired during measurement for future scientists to gain further insight into how nature truly behaves. It's just another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.